So uh, without further ado, let's talk about what makes Vancouver really such a good place uh, for uh, innovation and investment in the mobility sector. I'd like to turn to you, Christopher. You've come from um, far off Norway. You went to the University of British Columbia here, studied engineering. Uh, Spare is, I think, your second uh, uh, company you've started. So what's so great about Vancouver? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things kind of going for Vancouver. Uh, obviously, I think uh, access to great talent is a huge, yeah. huge opportunity for Vancouver. We have great universities that are increasing and becoming even greater. Uh, and the other big piece is that we have uh, really good immigration policies that are g getting better as we speak on bringing more talented people to this. So, it, and it's also, I would also say it has this environment of people wanting to move things forward here, that really people are seeing that, hey, one of the best exports Vancouver could do is export Vancouver itself, as in like the policies that have been done here, all of the great, that the land use policies that have been done here, and all of these things of, as you said, like connecting the, the, the land with the sea with the air uh, at the same time. So those and are some of the things. Yes, and I think what many people don't realize outside Vancouver is that the commitment to sustainability is not a recent one. It goes back decades. Yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, almost 20 years ago that Vancouver, you know, have declared its ambition to be the greenest city in the world when it wasn't very fashionable to do so. Jeanette, um, you lead Foresight, and so you have your finger on the pulse of so much that's happening in the innovation uh, sphere here. What are your thoughts, I mean, sort of a macro and micro perspective of, of this, this geography and why it's so interesting? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There we go. Hello? Oh, I think there we go. Nice to see everyone. Um, a great question. Um, so just to give you a little perspective, Foresight is Canada's largest clean tech accelerator, but we're from here in the Lower Mainland. We've built that from the Lower Mainland because there is a significant amount of passion and influence, not only by innovators, but the other stakeholders, the investment community, uh, the academic institutions, even industry taking a lead on, on really being honest about what net zero looks like and the type of innovation that they need to get there. Um, I think what's interesting in particular about, as you said, from a macro level, uh, I'm going to go even higher outside of Metro Vancouver and say that the fact that Clean BC was sort of put its, allowed BC to put a stake in the ground, that this is where we're going and we need to collaborate to get there was an instrumental step. It gives confidence for international investors and industry and even the innovation community to come to Vancouver to build, uh, to start and build their businesses here. We also have a long trajectory of, of mobility technologies. We'll start with Ballard, um, Westport, and you know those have become real going concerns and glo global recognition and the talent development from those you know, companies' ability to scale, you know, create spin outs and, and new technologies. Now, from the ground up, it's different. It's all about, for us, in, you know, Foresight's perspective is about infrastructure in supporting the innovation community, making sure that we're creating opportunities through things like this. And I think with the fact that 22 municipalities have come together and commit to collaboration through Metro Vancouver really just sets the tone that we're serious about pooling resources, setting priorities, and envisioning a, a, a clean mobility future for, for all um, residents. But could get into a lot of additional detail, macro level, um, clean BC, even the federal zero emission um, mandates, and then from the bottom up, I mean, the fact that uh, we have the most telus, uh, Teslas, I think, in the world <laughs> is just an indicator that it's not only government, it's, it's the community and the people that are, are ready to, to embrace um, the net zero transition. But, and then you also have in Vancouver, if I could add to that, uh, some incredible physical assets, uh, hydroelectricity, Water. Uh, the landscape here is yeah. it's 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 undeniably complex, um, which creates opportunity yes. to, like you said, deploy everything from the last mile technologies to you know how do we move people across in alternative to bridges so through clean um, water transport um, and obviously you have communities Surrey and Vancouver. There's people that are wanting to accelerate the pace that they get between those communities because there's cool things happening all around you know the Lower Mainland. Um, so it's it's certainly a dynamic 
mobility environment, um, not to mention the fact that we're completely dedicated to the social aspect of mobility and recognizing that it's not just about people who have the resources, it's about ensuring that everyone has access to mobility. Uh, and, and I think, again, as communities, we've truly embraced that. Right. Now, uh, Nicholas uh, Kivselius, you're the manager of new mobility at TransLink, which is the transportation agency uh, for this area. Um, it's a very unusual transportation agency since you, you cover a lot of bases, more than is usual for a transportation agency or operator, I think. But from your perspective, I mean, give us, uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges mm -hmm. here. Um, because you see everything. And by the way, I want to compliment you on the excellent gathering yesterday that you organized. Oh, thank you. Uh, where we, we, you brought together some interesting new mobility means uh, here. Yeah, I think uh, we, we are covering a vast geographic area with, with, the, with the bridges and, and all that. So, so this kind of compared to where I'm from in Europe, where we see much more denser cities, we, we have a quite complex challenge to, to get the, the people from A to B. And, and the equity concerns, like Janet brought up, we, we really want to see the whole region to, to get, get mobility. And uh, we have some cities like city of Surrey and all that, that that are growing very fast, and, and it's a growing region. So we barely keep up. We barely kept up before pandemic, and we have some very major uh, infrastructure investments uh, being rolled out now in the next years. So so it's a kind of it's, it's a challenge in geography and and uh, and and the densification that we will start to see will will come up. But we we are creating this spine of of public transit, and there I would say the like you said, the decades of politicians and, and uh, their mm, population here actually investing in the public transit network, rather than what we see in many North American cities being kind of uh, bringing the, the highways right into the city has kind of paid off. Right now, now perhaps we see that that was the good choices and this spine of, of public transit now needs to have more options around them. So that's why the micromobility, a lot of the innovation we see, see around mobility and in the private sector as well is, is going to be a really necessary complement to cover cover the whole region. So yes, we have a broad mandate um, on uh, p moving people and goods, actually, uh, which is quite unique in North America, but that, that comes with a lot of responsibility to try to coordinate and, and have a systematic approach to, to the whole region. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's exciting, but there, there, there are also challenges. I really wanted you to speak to that a little bit because uh, I'm an American. I come from south of the border here. Yeah. And American cities uh, have a certain Wild West quality, <laughs> if I can say so. And so, for example, uh, uh, a bird, uh, micro, the micromobility operator, launched micromobility by just putting electric scooters out in the streets of Santa Monica in mid in 2017. There's no regulatory framework. They went ahead. Lawsuits flied right and left. Um, that wouldn't happen here. So for example, there's a certain conservatism yeah. uh, in Vancouver and other Canadian cities. Does that impede uh, innovation in some ways or, or not? I mean, not, not your attitude towards ride hailing, for yes, example. I agree fully. We, it, it would be, uh, we would not be honest to say that we are early adopter. We are hopefully a fast follower, but that's not necessarily bad. Let's take ride hailing as an example. I think yeah. now we might have the best should we say regulations in terms of data sharing and all that with the ride hailing companies coming in, in North America at least? We waited long, uh, long enough, and then to the you know horror of many, many uh, people living here. But now, now we have a really good kind of deal with the ride hailing. It's it's very well regulated. I would I would say conservative for sure, but but the the conservatives can actually lead to that we take, you know, we don't jump on the bandwagon for anything new and we, scooters as well. I think it's a very fair level approach now to how we introduce micro mobility. Right. Um, so, so it doesn't have to impede innovation, but I think um, private sector investors and, and the operators have to be a bit more patient and, and we kind of try to get it right. <laughs> and I think this complexity, the 22 municipalities also adds a lot of complexity where right. stakeholder engagement is important here, much more than in many other cities in North America. So, Interesting. Yeah. Christopher, what are your views on this as... <laughs> as I'm, I'm, wait, I'm in the middle and I'm super excited. Answer? <laughs> as, as CEO... I love America. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. As, as CEO of Spare, you're right in the middle of the multimodal world. And yeah. is this 
kind of conservatism that we were just discussing, is that, how do you deal with that? I mean, you're anything but a conservative company. You're right at the yeah, for sure. cutting edge for sure. of so many of these things. Yeah, I do think that the, what Nicholas is saying here is that, that, you know, Vancouver is a fast follower, is, is, is very, very true, and they've done some incredible things. I do think that one thing that Vancouver is lacking is like this, this like trying things out mindset a little bit more. Um, but that comes in through many different things. Like, you know, the name of this conference is Mobility Investor Conference. Probably one of the most lacking things in the Vancouver ecosystem. This is not just for like mobility investors, but investors in general is like investors that are willing to just like bet on some, like a tiny little team with just an idea. Uh, the, the really early stage is something where probably Vancouver is really poor on, uh, like testing ideas out, betting on betting on like small teams with not a lot of experience. Um, once you've like grown a little bit and have like you know have some of that to show, you've probably shown it in different places outside of Vancouver. Then I think Vancouver is a great place to like further grow it. But I would say that Vancouver is probably a poor place to do much in terms of mo mobility, like new mobility, if you're just starting out. Naturally, <laughs> turn to you, Jeanette. I feel like I have so much to say on this. I, was, I wasn't sure. Um, definitely a complex topic. Um, so we too. I think there's, there's two sides of the coin. Uh, we were talking in our prep call about uh, autonomous vehicles, and uh, someone else on the panel rightly pointed out that with our SkyTrain infrastructure, we are actually one of the world leaders in autonomous vehicles. So if we think really fast forward looking, there are some cool examples of large infrastructure. But where we do see gaps is where there's a startup and or someone with a great idea, and the best thing to do is pilot your idea at home. And we haven't quite figured out how to have what we would call it foresight innovation sandboxes where there's a safe place with um, perhaps more flexibility on regulation to allow these ventures to really pilot. Um, I do want to recognize, I see some colleagues in the room, you know, uh, Project Greenlight, which was an initiative by Vancouver Economic Commission, has tried to create a platform for that. They want to, you know, put forward to the innovators that there's, you know, TransLink and other groups looking for innovation and that they're going to create a safe space to pilot that's going to have low risk. So there's, a, there's a, or an element of, of de-risk. And then hopefully from there we can more effectively scale and implement those technologies. So I think there's things happening, but we still tend to be quite conservative. Yeah, I, I think that really is important to create those physical sandboxes. And I, you know, in my hometown of Los Angeles, you know, we now have various innovation zones where the city says, okay, within this, you know, a ten block area, you can uh, demonstrate and pilot uh, robotic uh, deliveries of food, for example. Um, same thing in Miami is, exper is is experimenting with an innovation district. So I think that is a, quite an interesting model. Whether it can be applied exactly like that here, uh, I don't know. What are some of the sort of more intangible aspects of uh, Vancouver that can attract innovators? I mean, I, I think just frankly at a basic level, the ability to, uh, you know, on a Friday, you know, put in a few hours of hard work and then go off skiing. Um, uh, and you have some of the world's best skiing. I mean, the, the, it is such an attractive city. And I think those intangible aspects of a city are really important. I mean, quality of life concerns are, you know, it, it's sort of what makes us get up in the morning and, you know, want to bring up children, et cetera, and, and live in this. How important is that, I mean, for you? You know, you, and you come yeah, from a very sure. livable environment yeah. <laughs> in Norway, yeah. in, in Oslo. Yeah, bad comparison, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that one, one thing that makes, uh, makes Vancouver a really good place is that it's extremely competitive and people really want to live here, right. right? Now, can people afford to live here? That's, I guess that's another problem, but you know, it's an extremely livable city. And just as you said, like you can go, you know, in the ocean in the in the morning and, and, and skiing at night up on the mountains right next to us. So it's a, it's extremely attractive for people to to live here. So I, I do think that it has the right potential to really become like an incredible hub for for mobility investments and mobility startups. It's just it has the right foundation, I think. Right. What about just one quick question? We were talking about talent and human capital. Um, you run a company here. If you need to bring in talent from outside Canada, how easy is that process? 
Uh, I mean, it could always be easier, but we found it to be a fairly straightforward process. Um, so that has really helped us. Um, we've started in the last um, year or so to bring incredible talented people from outside of Canada to, to come here and, and uh, live and work and develop their career or their life here. So I've been very fortunate to be able to give people that opportunity and hope to do, do that even more going forward. Uh, I think we'll be fooling ourselves to think that we have all the greatest talent right here. There are a lot, there's a lot of great talent outside of Vancouver as well, and I think we should do it even ease, make it even easier to bring those people here. Right, 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 right. I want to turn to a, a perhaps a slightly disagreeable topic, and that is the state of the market and what the impact of that is going to be on everything that we're talking about, and with specifically here in Vancouver. And uh, Jeanette, I want to really address this question to you. We've seen a sort of massive sell-off uh, in the markets, uh, particularly uh, a lot in the mobility sector. And you have you know, the uh, SPACs, which were the darlings uh, uh, last year, are uh, in the gutter right now. Um, it's harder to raise capital. Uh, it's uh, uh, founders find it more difficult to raise cash. What are you seeing? What you know, and, and how is Vancouver maybe differentiated from sort of other uh, hubs of innovation? Um, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there's certainly. Hello, there you go. There's certainly some complexities here, right? Again, um, macro level, it's undeniable that any uncertainty in markets is going to cause people to take a pause, whether it's investors or industry looking to adopt new technologies, they're gonna be tightening their budgets and, and trying to put in a bit of a safeguard. Um, however, um, on the flip side, when you talk about you know Vancouver and the fact that a lot of people want to live here and work here and play here. Um, you know, being such an attractive place, I imagine it will still be a place that can perhaps create some barrier of resistance because there are still people that want to work and want to live and want to play here, which means that they're going to bring their dollars, their innovations, and their opportunities and connections to this market. Um, from a talent perspective, very similar. I think you know we're already seeing you know certain companies take some you know strong positions on layoffs and restructuring. Um, we haven't seen such a ripple effect here, at least in the, with the ventures and in the network that we're supporting from a clean tech perspective. Um, but I think you know there's no reason not to always have a finger of caution up um, while still being bullish on full steam ahead. I mean, um, most great companies tend to be able to navigate themselves through recession and in fact, or, or I don't, I didn't, can't believe I said the R word, but um, through a challenging economic time. And so, you know, from there, it's just important to recognize that there, there may be some changes. And um, I think in some cases, I know there's, there is talent, but we have a lot of people that are still hiring and can, can't find people. And even with some of the immigration rules relaxed right now to try to pull some people in. So, um, there's been strong investment dollars committed, not only within BC, but across Canada from a climate perspective. When you think about the net zero accelerator funding, when you think about all these commitments to transportation and infrastructure, um, it feels um, like there could be a bit of a, a, an armor on us, but I think it would be naive not to assume that we can't, um, you know, we, we shouldn't, you know, proceed with caution. I mean, TransLink, I'm sure, has a lot of conversations happening on that. Well, actually, that, thank you for that segue, Jeanette, because I did want to talk about TransLink. And, you know, one of the reasons I think you're absolutely right, Jeanette, is that, you know, there is um, such an imperative to pursue uh, zero emission policies, I mean, throughout our economies, that that won't, that will not be affected by anything happening in, in the markets, you know, from month to month, et cetera. It's a big, enormous, historic secular shift in how our economies operate. So it has legs. I think that's what we're, we're, we're all trying to say. But given that a big part of this is electrification and electrifying mobility, um, what can be done, Nicholas, and uh, to really step up investment in electrification, especially by TransLink? Because I know there have been some issues there. Mm -hmm. Could you address that, please? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have, we have, um, I would say, a quite aggressive electrification decarbonization strategy already in place. Our, our buses are going to be electric 
fairly soon we are making some major progress and on our talk but we have we have much to we have so much more to do we have large as a major infrastructure owner and operator we have so much facilities we we can look more into our non revenue fleet we have a number of uh, of uh, buildings with where we could work much more with energy management and so on so so to just electrify our fleet which is our first step is just the beginning and i think there there i think we are very i like to bring up us as a important buyer the, the kind of the market power or the the buying power of of uh, such a big government entity should be put into use also for innovation of course for the climate emergency but i think we within the next years now when we procure innovative solutions we should i mean a become more educated inside uh, this kind of big translink bureaucracy on what's out there so events such as this and, and meeting really meeting with the entrepreneurs and and so on and opening up windows for new ideas it's going to be more and more important and then also kind of from from large to small from our bus procurement down to when we're buying you know concrete for our for, for our buildings we need to get get more knowledgeable about what the state of the art of sustainable tech is uh, so that's what we're working on I, I i also like you brought up the project green light i think even outside these massive kind of buying public procurement projects i think we can open up much more kind of demonstrator sandboxes uh, and we're working with the VC, uh, like you mentioned and i think also together with other major infrastructure owners such as you know you see hydro and fortis and other we, we could kind of connect the dots a bit more and we, we are facing the same challenges so so why do we work a little bit in such a silos i think the major government you know crown corps and all that should be talk a bit more i think uh, and address the challenges together so that's those are the few uh, things we're working on but Electrification is going to be a major shift for sure, and and just on that, it's uh, it's a shift, you know, towards other skill upskilling of our workforce. It's not only to invest in this new tech, but we have to really look into how we are going to upskill our mechanics and how how the delivery of our services is going to look like. And and this is is a major, a very interesting shift we are doing now in electrifying our buses. So. Let me, I think it would be unfair in a, con in a conversation around Vancouver's an emerging mobility dynamo to not mention uh, hydrogen. Um, Vancouver is such an important hydrogen hub, and many refer to it as the Silicon Valley of hydrogen. Um, we are super bullish in the long term about hydrogen. Is that something you're looking at at TransLink and for, for buses or for other kinds of sort of heavy duty equipment? And Jeanette, how do you look at hydrogen? Are there enough sort of investable projects out there yet? Or is it still something that is a little bit in the future? I can, I can start and say that the first kind of approach for us was is in, in depot charging. So this electrification, no hydrogen. Right. Um, but we don't rule out other renewable energy. We, our bus, buses run, don't run that, that long distances and all that we also have as you can look out there, a few ferries, which I, I uh, you know, can imagine we soon would like to to uh, to investigate and see how, how perhaps hydrogen could could play a role and all. But 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 it's sorry to challenge you on that. I mean, if you look at Norway, Norway already has for quite a few years hydrogen uh, fuel cell powered ferries. You know, why why haven't you jumped into that here in Vancouver? It's with all your hydropower cheap electricity it mm -hmm. seems to be a natural yeah i mean we are a small play on the maritime but then we have bc bc ferries of course and, yeah. and that's the whole system yeah I, I mean hydrogen is interesting but i think we have to start somewhere and and the first kind of launch for us was to, to take take a big kind of pollutant was our major bus fleet yeah. so we start there and then uh, take yeah. it yeah, <clears throat> so, you know, again, with supporting so many innovators, we happen to have a lot of hydrogen-focused uh, companies here in, in Vancouver, so there's certainly a hub of innovation where there's opportunities. Um, 
you know, we've obviously seen uh, BC government invest in some of the HTAC stations, so we're deploying hydrogen fueling stations for some of the hydrogen vehicles that every consumer can, can buy, if you can get one right now. Obviously, there's supply chain challenges. But from a broader perspective, you know, the way we look at hydrogen, yes, it's a, a huge economic opportunity for the region. Yes, we know that there are significant industry buyers that are interested in setting up shop here to produce mass amounts of hydrogen, which should create an environment and an ecosystem for innovation, for investment, to capitalize on that source of, of fuel and energy. And we're seeing that. I know Elizabeth Charmley's here, who runs the Vancouver Maritime Center. You know, they're having conversations on you know, how the maritime sector can collaborate to, like you said, break down silos and figure out what technologies might be best to explore from a pilot perspective. Um, HTEC, again, they, you know, they just recently had a $210 million investment. Um, they're deploying hydrogen solutions across the province and beyond. So th I think there's a hotbed here uh, on this topic. I think we do need to move a little more quickly. We're seeing announcements around the world, in particular Edmonton, even just across the border. Um, there's a $30 million investment to set up a hydrogen production facility, right? So we need to, I think we need to stake our ground, get the production going, figure out where hydrogen can be utilized, not only in mobility, but across, you know, the entire industrial uh, energy sector. And then I think, you know, we can have a, a really interesting merger of supply and demand that creates, you know, economic um, success for the region. So. Okay.